Welcome to the e-commerce badassery podcast, the place for scrappy female entrepreneurs who want to learn actionable steps and strategies to grow the traffic, sales, and profit in your e-commerce business. I'm your host, Jessica Totillo Coster, a 20-year retail veteran who spent three years as the only employee of a seven-figure online store. That shit was crazy. I know exactly how it feels to do all the things and I'm sharing everything I learned the hard way so you don't have to. I may have started this business by accident, but supporting badass bosses like you lights me the fuck up and I am so stoked to see you grow. Are you ready, babe? Let's roll. What is up, e-commerce friend? Welcome back to a fresh new episode of the e-commerce badassery podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Jatillo Coster. Today, we're chatting about my favorite thing, email marketing, and we're going to roll right on into it. So one of my favorite things about email is its ability to make you money on autopilot. You know, all those email automations that you set up in advance to communicate with your customers and nudge them toward the sale, like your welcome series, checkout abandonment, post-purchase, etc. If you don't already have these set up, by the way, check out episode three of the podcast and make sure you check out the accompanying guide in the resource center to get these set up for your e-commerce business. And while automation is amazing and can help you build a relationship with your customers and make you money while you sleep, they're only set it and forget it-ish. One of the key pillars to email marketing and my badass email marketing framework is to always be testing. As much research and strategizing you do when you're first setting up your email marketing, you're never going to hit it out of the park the first time. And even if you do, with our lives and environments changing so often, especially right now, your customers' needs, wants, and behaviors are changing as well. So what worked really well three months ago might not work as well right now. In order to get the most out of your email marketing, you'll want to make sure you're consistently trying to improve it. And the best way to do that is to test and try new things. And this is the case with any marketing activity in your business and hell, even your operations. One of the worst things you can do is default to a system, process, or strategy simply because that's the way it's always been done. We can go down a rabbit hole about the importance of innovation in business, hello blockbuster, but that's a conversation for another day. For today, I really want to focus on improving your email marketing and how you can use testing to accomplish that. And everything I'm going to talk about is relevant for your automation and your one-off campaigns. So there are seven main things you can test and should be testing in your emails. Segments, who you're sending the email to. Subject lines, your hook to get them to open the email. Content, what's inside the email. Time of day and day of week, when you're sending it. Frequency, how often you're sending. The landing page, where you're sending them after they click the email and sender name and email. Who is it being sent from? So let's break each of these down a bit further. Let's start with segments. Now you hear me talk a lot about segmentation and like you've probably heard me say before, I don't want you to go too deep here, especially if your list is on the smaller side. And hyper segmentation can be overwhelming and actually have a negative effect on your revenue, But if you have some high level separation in your list, then you'll definitely want to start using it. And I'll give you an example. A client I used to work with sells active wear for pregnant and nursing moms. Her very first product was a nursing sports bra. She has since expanded to leggings and did a feature on The View and Good Morning America for her leggings. So the email subscribers she collected through those features aren't necessarily pregnant or nursing moms. So we would always separate the messaging that we were sending them because those nursing sports bras weren't relevant to everyone on her list. The other example I always give to illustrate this is if you sell men's, women's, and children's clothing. I have no kids, so if a brand is sending me emails about kids' clothing, it's not relevant to me and I'm not going to open, click, or buy from those emails. 
So like I said, you don't have to get super crazy here, but do look for those obvious segments in your business and try testing different messages and product features to these different groups of your list. The other way you can use segmentation is based on where the customer is at in their journey with your business. And I talk all about this on episode 68 of the podcast. So definitely go take a listen if you want to explore that more. Next up is subject lines. This is a pretty obvious one and likely still the test that's done most often by email marketers. But in my experience, it's not as impactful as some of the other tests we're going to talk about. Plus, with the rollout of iOS 15 looming, we're not going to have all that open data anyway. I do recommend, though, if you've never tested subject lines before, then I would start doing some right now so that by the time you lose that open data, you already know what does and doesn't work. If you're not sure what to test, here's a few ideas for you. Emojis versus no emojis. Witty, funny, or suggestive subject lines versus straight and to the point personalized with their name or the product versus not personalized. Remember, you can do this in your flows and your campaigns. When I set up a new client's email flows, I often will add A-B tests into their flows so we can figure out what their audience responds to best. An example here is for an abandoned checkout email. One version might say, did you leave this behind? Super generic, common for abandoned checkout, but obvious, right? The other might say, benefit their product offers awaits. If you're going to test your flows like this, you want to make sure you're getting a good amount of traffic moving through them before you make any final decisions. I usually tell my clients to leave them up for about 90 days before they assess the performance, but those are usually people who have pretty high traffic with lots of people moving through them. If you're newer and you don't have a lot of people going through your flows, leave them a little bit longer. At a minimum, get 100 people moving through there, but ideally you would have more than that. If you're going to test in campaigns, I'd rather see you send out the A-B test to your entire list with a full 50-50 split versus sending it to only 20% of your list and then sending the winner to the rest. It's not an apples to apples comparison and I don't find it as helpful. When it comes to determining the winner, we're naturally going to be looking at the open rate. And that's good. That's what you should be doing. But don't ignore all your other metrics. For instance, maybe one version got a lower open rate, but a higher click rate and generated more revenue. Does that really mean that the other one was truly a better subject line? It's hard to say. It's possible while that version got a lower open rate, it performed better because it was more in line with the messaging inside and the ultimate goal of the email. So it reached a more qualified audience. I know, I know, I hate when there's a gray area too, but I swear I straight up live in the gray. I see all the shades. It's a blessing and a curse really. The thing is, while data is amazing and can tell you a lot about your success, email is really an art and a science. So you'll want to use a bit of your intuition along the way. Next up, let's talk about your content. And there are a bunch of things you can test when it comes to the content itself in your email. And the ultimate goal for this step is to increase your click rate. So if you think about what influences a click rate, it could be visually based things like the color of your buttons, the layout of your email, whether it's full of images or mostly text based. Do you have a photo on the top or do you lead with a great headline? But it can also be specifically related to the calls to action you use. Do you say shop now or buy more? How about see or learn more? Are you telling them to save their cart or complete their purchase? Are you including the benefit your product offers in the call to action that you use? Are you telling them what they'll get when they click through or are you keeping it vague to pique their interest? You've got a lot of options, friend. Another thing about content is that so many people will tell you to make sure you only have one call to action in your emails, and I'm sure I've given that advice as well. And when it comes to best practices, that's definitely one of them. But I do know a lot of people that send monthly newsletters with many calls to action that do just fine. So if it works for you, your customer, and your business, it's okay to keep doing it. I'm working with a client right now who has been sending a weekly newsletter for years with lots of information in it. 
When we consulted the first time a couple of years ago, I told her to keep doing it because it was generating so much damn revenue. And at that point, she had already trained her customers to expect it. Plus, it made it pretty easy for her to plan her biz operations because she knew when that email went out, she would get a spike in orders. Now, a few years later, she's still sending that newsletter email and it's still generating a ton of revenue. But her business has grown tremendously and she's a lot busier now. And the weekly newsletter is starting to take its toll because it takes her a long time to put it together. And when I say newsletter, it's like real newsletter with written content and tons of stuff. So we did a test. She sent 50% of her list the standard long-form newsletter, and she sent the other 50% a shortened version of that newsletter with about half the information in it. And what do you think the results were? Exactly the same. Literally. Open rate, click rate, revenue generated, all exactly the same. So what does that mean? She doesn't have to keep creating these super long newsletters. Instead, she can break the information out over two emails in a week if she wants, or if she's short on time, she knows just getting out one shorter newsletter will still contribute the same revenue to her business. Ultimately, when it comes to email, while there are certainly best practices and proven strategies, if your data tells you something different, that's okay. Do what works for you and your audience. Now let's talk about time of day and day of week testing. One of the questions I hear most often is, when is the best time to send an email? And the truth is, there's no best time for everyone. It really depends on your audience and what their schedule is like. The closest thing I've seen to a universally best time to send is Sunday evenings between 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern. Which makes sense, right? The majority of us are home lounging around on the couch and watching Netflix and scrolling through our phones. If you've never tried sending emails on a Sunday night, I suggest you try it. When it comes to testing this, it can be a bit harder to do if your list is on the smaller side. Klaviyo has a feature called Smart Send Time where you send an evergreen email to your entire list over a 24-hour period. Then, based on the results, Klaviyo will tell you what your best send time is. But I think you need like 12,000 subscribers to have access to this feature. Otherwise, they found it to not be statistically relevant. I will say when I used it at my day job, it did confirm what I already knew about my people. Now, was that because we had already been sending emails at that time for a few years and my customers were trained? Or was it because it really was the right time? I don't know. But it seems to be a reliable feature. If you don't have access to that, the best way to test is to just send a lot of emails and set up some manual tests. Some platforms will have a feature that lets you send the same email a bit at a time over a few hours. So you can try that, right? It'll send like 20% of your list every hour or something like that. You can also just randomly split your main newsletter list into two random groups. Send the same email to one segment in the morning and the other in the evening and see which one gets better metrics. This type of test is where you're really going to need to look at all of the metrics together. Just seeing a better open rate or click rate doesn't mean it's the winner here. For instance, you may see a higher open and click rate if you send during lunchtime because people are getting burnt out on their workday and looking for a distraction. But that doesn't mean they're ready to whip out their credit card and make a purchase. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's possible you'll have one day or a time with a lower open rate, but higher revenue. You can use this same strategy to test your day of the week, too. Randomly split your main list and send to one group on Sunday and the other on Tuesday, for example. When it comes to testing time and day, I would cycle through these as you determine a winner and test them against a new hypothesis. So, for example... Let's say you split an email on Sunday, one in the morning and one in the evening. Then the next week, you can split your email against the winning time on Sunday at the same time a different day of the week, like Thursday. You follow? Again, there are a lot of nuances here as well. You've probably heard me tell this story before, but I had two major instances where my tried and true Sunday night emails failed. Super Bowl Sunday and the series finale of Game of Thrones. Make sure you're thinking about your audience and their typical behavior when you're hypothesizing these tests. Okay, next on the list is frequency. How often are you sending emails? 
This is probably the top question I get about email marketing. And of course, my answer is it depends. Typically, if you're trying to figure out how often you should send an email, start with thinking about your product and how your customer uses it. Then consider the size of your list. Typically, the larger your list, the wider your product assortment, and the more frequent your customer uses your product, the more emails you can send. On the flip side, if you're a one product store and your customer only needs to buy from you once every four to six months, you'll probably want to send less email. But how do you figure it out specifically for your business? Well, you start testing, of course, and here's how you can do that. Let's say you're currently sending one email per week and you have been doing that for the last few months. For the next eight weeks, start sending two emails per week. No, I don't want you to jump from one email a week to four. That's going to throw off your subscribers. I want you to go in small increments so you can watch the metrics along the way. So now you're sending two emails per week. If all of your metrics stay strong, then for the next eight weeks, increase it again to three emails a week. And you can keep doing that to see how far you can push it. But I want you to also remember that consistency is more important than frequency. So if you get up to sending three or four emails a week for a few months, and then all of a sudden you drop off the face of the earth, your list is going to get whiplash and ultimately will lead to higher churn. So how do you know if your list can handle this increase? You need to look at all of your metrics, including your unsubscribe and spam rates. So you want your unsubscribe rate to be less than 0.3% and your spam rate to be less than 0.08%. Naturally, you're also going to look at your open and click rates. Here's the thing. As you send more email, those are naturally going to come down, but that's okay as long as your unsub and spam rate stay below those benchmarks and your revenue is going up. Now, if your open rate starts to get into single digits, then you definitely want to pull back. If you want to learn more about what benchmarks you should be using to assess the health of your e-commerce business and your email marketing, check out episode 19 of the podcast where I walk you through all of those numbers. Okay, next up, let's talk about the landing page. Because yes, you can do all this awesome shit in your emails, but if the page you send them to is crap or doesn't align with what was in that email, it's not going to create a great experience. If you think about the journey from receiving your email to actually making a purchase, there's a lot of steps in that process. First, you need to get into their inbox when they're likely to see it and have a subject line enticing enough to open. Then the content inside has to make them want to click through to learn more. And then the landing page is where you actually get them to convert. And when I say landing page, I don't mean the typical landing page we associate with that word like a sales page used in informational product marketing that has no header or footer. I just mean the destination you're sending them to. So one, is that landing page any good? Is it doing the selling for you? When it comes to your product pages, if you haven't already listened to the episode with Reese Spikerman where we talk all about this, it's episode 71. I'll stick a link in the show notes. That will help you understand how to create product pages that convert. But also, is it making the experience easy for your customer? Aside from your welcome email, in general, I would say avoid sending them to your homepage if you can. It's just too general and leaves them to have to make more decisions like where to go and what to click on. If your email isn't about anything specific, like, you know, you can't send them to a specific collection or a blog post or something, try sending it to your best sellers category instead of your homepage. But remember, you want to test this. Create two different content versions, one with a button that links to the homepage and the other that links to your best sellers. You may also want to test out creating landing pages for big holidays. Like for Q4, you can create a landing page that links to all of your gift guides or for Mother's Day or for Valentine's Day. This, by the way, should be much easier when you migrate onto Shopify 2.0, but you can do it now with a page builder like Gem Pages if you need to. Just remember that the job of the landing page is to do the selling for you, so you'll want to make sure it's creating a great experience for your visitors. Is it clear and easy to understand? Do you have the right copy on there? Are your images clear? Is it relevant to the messaging you shared and the action you want them to take? 
And then last but not least is testing the sender name and email. Yes, this can make a difference in your emails. So some ideas here. Are your emails being sent from a generic email like info at or hello at? Or is it coming from you as the founder or even a customer service person? Admittedly, I haven't played with this a ton because the majority of my background is in corporate and most of my clients have pretty big businesses and don't want their inboxes clogged up with replies or to put their email out there like that, which I totally get. But it's still worth testing. And keep in mind that a lot of platforms will let you send from one email but have replies go to another so you don't have to worry about replies coming to your inbox specifically but it will make your email visible, which is something to consider. Not that a customer couldn't figure out what it was if they really wanted to anyway, first name at website URL, anyone? In terms of results, I've seen it differ across businesses. Some do better when it's from the founder, others when it's from a customer service associate. Some even better when it's just from a generic email because that is what customers have come to expect. If you don't want to change the actual email it's being sent from, you could just change the sender name. So instead of it just being from your brand name, maybe it's your first name at your brand name. And you may want to only change it for certain emails like your post-purchase thank you. I usually will recommend that you create a text-based thank you email after someone makes their first purchase with you. Something that looks like you sat down at your desk and wrote it. This is a great example of an email that you can make look like it came from you specifically instead of the generic name and email you use for the rest of your marketing emails. One last note about testing. Please only test one variable at a time, otherwise you won't know what is or isn't working. So if you want to test subject lines, keep all the other variables we talked about the same between those two emails right? Same content, same day, same time. And that is true with all of these elements. Only test one variable at a time. All right, so let's recap the seven things you can test in your emails to improve your results. Segments and who you're sending your emails to. Subject lines, your hook to get them to open the email. Content, what's actually inside the email the time of day and day of week when you're sending it, your frequency, how often you're sending emails, your landing page, where are you sending them after they click the email, and lastly, the sender name and email, which represents who the email is being sent from. If you haven't already been testing these things or you're not sure what works best with your customer, now is a really great time to start so that you have the data and the insights by the time we hit our peak holiday selling season. You don't necessarily have to test all the things. Just start with the ones that you're most unsure of and then slowly work on the rest of the tests. And that, my friends, is a wrap on today's episode. Thank you so much for hanging out and I'll see you on the flip side. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful if you'd leave a review on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you're looking to surround yourself with more product entrepreneurs who totally get your life right now, get your booty on over to the e-commerce badassery Facebook group. Can't wait to see you there. Until next time, e-commerce friends, stay badass.